Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Grafana Office Hours. I'm Nicole van der Hooven, and I've invited another one of my colleagues today to help me talk to you about how to install Grafana on Kubernetes and really everything you need to know about Kubernetes and Grafana. Welcome, Usman Ahmad. Hello, thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone. Yeah, it's good to be back. Another session, another fun session, this time mostly for Kubernetes. So yeah, I'm very excited Like for, for all those who wants to learn this one. Yeah. So, well, for those who didn't watch your the first episode with you, which was on Docker, can you just introduce yourself a little bit? Like, what do you do at Grafana and how long have you been here? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm uh, working in Grafana Labs uh, as a developer advocate, and I've been here for about a year now. And uh, my role is to help basically the uh, the OSS community of the Grafana, which could be anything from Grafana to Loki or any of those products. And uh, I'm very <laughs> busy still with the community forms to help uh, users uh, with technical questions also on GitHub and so on. And uh, beside that, I also uh, start doing talks in public speaking. So yeah, keep watching, keep watch out if I am near you uh, in your area. So come and join my talk and it will be fun. <laughs> Coming soon to a conference near you, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Usman, I know the last time that you were here, we talked about how to install Grafana specifically on Docker. You know, there are a few ways we just to give people a bit of an overview. We talked about how there are different ways to install Grafana. You can, you know, download a binary depending on your operating system and definitely install it directly that way. But we also talked a lot about the advantages of installing Grafana within Docker. And if you want more information on on that, then check out the link in the description below, and I'll make sure that we have a link there to our my previous conversation with Usman about just that, because we will still be talking about Docker actually here, but we won't go into as detail about what Docker is and, and everything as we did in the previous one, which was all Docker all the time. So today we want to talk about a, the third way to install Grafana, which is on Kubernetes. And yeah. I, I don't know if you noticed this one. Look. Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> you are the most exclusive one for the Kubernetes. You know, like this is very uh, decorated <laughs> T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have three Kubernetes T-shirts, so I had to decide today, which one to wear today. <laughs> and, and today I wear for this for Grafana. <laughs> oh, how good! <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> so we make a perfect match: Grafana plus Kubernetes. <laughs> How funny! We didn't even we didn't even plan that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I maybe we should start about just like a brief history of of how we got to Kubernetes. I mean, we talked about this a little bit with with Docker, um, but I feel like um, Kubernetes is another evolution in the in the whole process of distributed computing. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. Um, we started in the past uh, the concept of like we have to create uh, uh, multiple machines for for backup purposes, for for redundant storage, and so on. And it was the time when uh, people used to buy hardware equipment. Like you have seen, like server rooms full of like twenty machines running together, and uh, it was needed at that time. But uh, the downfall was the cost and the maintenance, especially. Uh, you only just not to maintain the machine, but you have to maintain the whole room, the whole infrastructure as well. And you need people uh, 24 by 7. Uh, then it was the time that uh, comes for the virtual machines part. Like they start getting popular into the market. They were flexible uh, and easy to install and configure. And they can do the job which you need uh, to buy on a like a real hardware equipment, you can just use a virtual machine, which is basically a software piece of code, I would say, and you can run your applications there. Uh, that went really well, and I think it's still going well, but uh, it has also some limitations because as technology is evolving, we are making more complex and rich products, so things are required more and more with the passage of time. So one of the problem with virtual uh, machines is like, uh, uh, 
although they are not expensive, they are very resource hogging. So once you deploy maybe one or two virtual machine on your machine, and if they are very extensive, uh, running extensively, I would say like a, a heavy product or application, uh, then you probably feel the resources is very less even though you buy a very big amount of RAM or this space and uh, and you run into other problems as well. And then the era come of Docker. Docker was very new, uh, but it was already uh, uh, run around internally with different projects. I don't know the whole history, and uh, but uh, it got very popular because it was again um, like virtual machine. It was it do also support cross platform, so you can run Docker on Windows, Mac, Linux, etc. And the cool thing was that. Um, Docker provide this uh, uh, idea that you can deploy a uh, application as a container image. So that means that um, uh, you do it will run anywhere, everywhere without needing of config extra configuration because the image is uh, bundled in a uh, all the inf all the configuration or the uh, packages file is bundled in a container image. So yeah, I think uh, I I would say Docker is still a very big player in the market. But again, we come to the point that we are making more complex and rich applications, so we need more requirements and more resources. Uh, one of the down uh, drawbacks or limitation, I would say, of Docker was the concept we called uh, uh, container orchestration, which means like how the services uh, uh, can be get monitored or high availability or scaling up uh, the application as required with, uh, for example, if you have, suppose if you have an application and you re you de design it for maybe for 100 users, but with the passage of time, you are have now 500 users, how you can increase uh, it, like how you can scale it. So there were some challenges in that area. And then uh, comes now the Kubernetes. Kubernetes is basically a project by Google. It started initially by Google. And it was initially remain internal, but then it get public and it's now open source and uh, available for everyone. And uh, and Kubernetes actually overcomes all those challenges like container orchestration, scaling, high availability, and monitoring as well. So yeah, uh, this is the reason why Kubernetes is uh, still like a strong and popular player in the market. So. And we're going to take a look more how to use Kubernetes with, uh, with Grafana. Yeah, so I want to show like a little, a quick um, image as well, just to illustrate what you've just said. Um, this is from my personal notes, actually. And this is uh, the, well, this is not my, my image. Um, I do have that. I got that from somebody else, actually. Uh, I can't remember exactly whom right now. Oops. And now I've moved on to another note. But um, this is the what Usman was talking about, how we used to go from just different apps being on physical computers, on hardware, and then we moved over to a virtualized model where now there's a hypervisor. And even though um, there are still apps there, multiple apps, they're still segregated into virtual machines. And then now um, instead of virtual machines, sorry, go on. Yeah, I was. I just want. sorry for interruption. Maybe just uh, make it a big bigger so that uh, our viewers can see it. Okay, sure. Um, let me do that. Maybe just one more. Yeah, looks much better. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and then, uh, so we were here for the virtual machines. And then um, this is where we're at with Docker. So Docker is another type of container. And I feel like really these are something we get into semantics, right? It can get kind of confusing. Like what what's the difference between a Docker and a virtual machine? Um, really in effect, it, they're still buckets of things. There's still ways to group different resources. In general though, a virtual machine usually has its own operating system and its own resources and um, also multiple apps, whereas containers are even more modular. They're more atomic groupings. The problem is um, 
that these containers can also get quickly out of control. It's like in this in this image, it's one app per container, right? And what if you have multiple apps? Well, that's that's going to be a problem. Then you have lots and lots of containers. And that's when you really need something to manage it. So I think of Kubernetes as like a traffic cop and yeah. a container is one of the cars in it. And the cars have different people in it, could have things in it. But K Kubernetes or other or container orchestration um, engines is the one that kind of says where things should go and how many cars uh, are allowed to to go through when the traffic light is green and that kind of thing. Yeah, this is really, uh, I, I totally agree. And also there is a very miscon misconception in the, in, the, in the people, especially those who are beginning their IT journey. Uh, it, uh, Kubernetes might be right now the most hot, hottest topic, but you don't need to run everything on Kubernetes because there are some cost factors you have to realize. So if you're, if you feel like your application can be run and work smoothly on Docker, you really need to push it to also work it on Kubernetes because you have to check some boundaries and limitations, like for example, cost or the, or the uh, maintenance part as well, because it doesn't mean that if everything runs on Kubernetes, doesn't mean like it's, uh, it's, uh, it will work always. It can work, but maybe in some cases, it is maybe too much expensive and it may not work in your in your specific case. So uh, it's a good uh, info I wanted to share because this is asked a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe this is a good time to go over like a, a little bit about Kubernetes. So, you know, what I don't know if you want to go through your presentation now. Yeah, sure. So I would like to share this slide. So uh, let me move uh, to the slide in the slideshow view. So, so this is, uh, I created a small slide, uh, how to run Grafana on Kubernetes. And first is the introduction. Uh, I just want to mention there's a, I created from uh, these from my notes, but I do not own any of those pictures. So it's uh, taken from internet, but they are really useful. So I wanted to, to share with, with all of you. So what is Kubernetes? So in, in very short, Kubernetes is basically a, a way or, or a system to run multiple uh, containers on different machines or different containers on different machines. And why we use Kubernetes? Well, when you need to run many different containers with different images, then it's more appropriate to use Kubernetes instead of Docker. And then comes to the part of uh, orchestration or container orchestration. So this word is a bit tricky, but uh, what Kubernetes really gives you or the advantage is, for example, with Kubernetes, uh, it covers the part of automatic deployment that uh, your container application gets deployed automatically on different servers. Distribution of the load as well on different uh, servers. Auto scaling, which we just dis discuss as an example, like if you need to scale based on the traffic you are getting, you need to deploy more or maybe less. You don't need to deploy 500 uh, 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 like uh, uh, an application for 500 users when you know like maybe only 200 will be the target audience. So it is called auto scaling to downsize or upsize. Monitoring and health checks also uh, are included in the Kubernetes in, and same for re uh, replacement, which is basically means like high ability ifs. For example, if one of your Kubernetes uh, uh, node is failing, then Kubernetes will automatically replace it with a new one. So this, all of these are uh, as a combined can be set as a Kubernetes advantages. And that means like it provides these orchestration tools, which is included in Kubernetes. And this is something not very much included in Docker. And we now take a look that why we not use Docker. So, <laughs> uh, so this is a small difference. I will try to explain on a high level why, where the uh, difference are stand. So, for example, Docker also use containers, uh, but for isolated environments for application, while in Kubernetes, you have an infrastructure which you want to maintain uh, uh, for multiple containers. Similarly, second point says like uh, Docker are used a lot for automated buildings and deployment, like the CI part of the applications, while Kubernetes is used 
not for the CI part, but it is used for the automated scheduling or management of your application containers, which you are using in the application environment or in a, 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 a real environment. Yeah. Um, I will skip the, uh, the, the rest because it is covered in more detail in the next slide. Um, there is one so, interesting. Hang on. Yeah. Um, would you mind going back for a second? I just wanted to uh, explain because, you know, in case we, I don't think we've actually talked about it. We're mm -hmm. talking about Docker and Kubernetes here, but they're not really, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. In fact, you could run Docker within Kubernetes or Kubernetes within right. Docker, and um, you can use them both. And that's a very common use case for it. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, Kubernetes is uh, does need a Docker image uh, uh, to run your application. All through, with that image, when it gets deployed, it uses all those container orchestration tools or, or uh, techniques, which gives you the advantage which you do not get uh, directly in Docker. So uh, that is totally uh, makes sense to uh, tell that it that Kubernetes doesn't mean that it will not use the Docker image. Thanks. And uh, yeah, uh, one more thing is uh, which comes a lot time to time like, hey, uh, why not use Docker Swarm? Because the, uh, when the Kubernetes was uh, uh, getting the uh, uh, hype or the importance uh, in the market, uh, there was a thing uh, and it still exists, it's called Docker Swarm. So in a in a high level, there are a few differences which you can see. So for example, Kubernetes, yes, it is very complex while Docker Swarm is very easy to install, but uh, Kubernetes do provide more uh, uh, um, more support, for example, auto scaling, monitoring and uh, load balancing and so on. While in Docker Swarm, you have to, for example, do the scaling manually. You probably need uh, some third party tools for the monitoring and uh, and so on. There are some like uh, pros and cons on each side, but uh, uh, in general, Kubernetes is is, uh, is better if you need all of these things uh, as a one combined package because it doesn't make sense that, for example, if you are using Docker Swarm and you need three or four more uh, third party application to complete the whole coverage, then then it make more sense to directly use Kubernetes. Yes, it will be uh, complex and it will be a very high learning curve. But once that curve is uh, reached, then uh, you only need Kubernetes. So you avoid the further complexity uh, into going uh, and running other applications just for uh, uh, monitoring and other areas. Um, this is the basic. Uh, architecture of Kubernetes. So um, uh, Kubernetes have uh, basically uh, can be defined that you have a, a, a main server and on this main server, you have basically API server, a control manager, scheduler and etcd. API server is like a gateway keeper. So uh, whenever we type something on Kubernetes, either via command line or via API, uh, it is reached to uh, it is uh, uh, it is read by or uh, taken by the API server and it process it and then follow uh, the instructions whatever it is required. Then this instruction goes to the control manager. As the name says, it's control and manages what is required and so on. Scheduler basically it schedule, schedules the pod like when a pod should be uh, running, when should it should be replaced and so on. And etcd. Etcd, in very short, it's basically like a brain of the Kubernetes cluster. It stores all the key information uh, and, uh, and and it knows uh, everything what to do what because all of these components also link with Etcd, uh, uh, if I remember correctly from my lectures. <laughs> uh, but Etcd is the core part. So without Etcd, it will be used. The Kubernetes will not work uh, correctly. So this is the uh, main server and for main server, then comes the part of worker uh, servers uh, on workers or nodes. So on worker nodes, basically here, uh, our uh, uh, Docker application or container images are deployed and they run. So as you can see in the, in the picture that, for example, on, on a single node, we have deployed three containers on node two, we have one and so on. 
and uh, uh, and in interact with the in the main server. There is also one important point to inform that there is a network, a virtual network layer. This is used for the communication and it creates a one unified machine. So for example, when we deploy something on Kubernetes and we write the basic command using kubectl get, uh, get uh, services, uh, this is all happening uh, using this virtual network because we pass our instructions to the API server. API or API server or the component follows our instruction and process it and communicate with the worker nodes and then we get back our information. So this is all the whole summary of a Kubernetes basic architecture. Yeah, okay, that that makes sense. Um, I also just wanted to share this quickly. Um, just to give a like kind of a zoom out picture of of what it looks like. So this is the what what Usman was talking about. These individual ones. These are two of the worker ones, and then this control plane. Um, and this entire thing is called the cluster. And maybe we should talk about what what that is. A cluster is really a group of of um, components that all usually have to do with with one service or, or something like that. It's usually semantically grouped um, and it could be related to a, a certain app, for example, with each pod being, you know, like one pod might have the database and another one, you know, might have the authentication server or something like that, different components all related to the one thing. And that's called a cluster. And um, also it's worth noting that there's a difference between a node and a pod. So they're like different levels with Kubernetes, right? And that's what kind of makes it really difficult because you now have to transition from thinking about Kubernetes or applications at just you know the, the server, physical server level. You have to think about it as a cluster-wide thing, then as a node, which is the physical hardware, and then again as the pod, because each one of those yeah. can have different resources and you might want to control them separately. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are different levels or hierarchies also in Kubernetes, like you have, uh, uh, you are running a node and inside that node, you are running a container image, which you deployed and then uh, using it. So that totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and, sorry, uh, you, do you want to keep going? Yeah, and I have uh, then uh, this a small image, uh, which is uh, really interesting for, for people who are in, uh, do the software uh, development process. So uh, we discuss a lot like uh, that, uh, that uh, Kubernetes do need the Docker image and where does it uh, how does it work and uh, uh, plays its role. So this is a very interesting image, which I found like uh, you create a Docker image uh, or develop a Docker container uh, by building an image using the Docker build tools and you push it to uh, a Docker registry. And um, and basically that registry, for example, is commonly uh, it's hub.docker.com and then your image is publicly available. You can actually also do private uh, Docker registry, use private Docker registry, registry as well, but depends on your use case. And uh, once uh, it is there, then you instruct in your, uh, in your Kubernetes code or the YAML code that I want this uh, image, which is available uh, publicly or privately and give it the path. And then that uh, image gets deployed uh, in your Kubernetes node. So yeah. Nice, I like that image. <laughs> yeah, I like too because it's it covers actually the whole process of CI, the uh, uh, continuous integration that you keep building, improving your code in the and then push it to uh, to the registry, and then it is used for the cluster uh, in the Kubernetes. Yeah, and maybe it's also maybe we should also talk about you know um, a little bit about how you actually configure Kubernetes. One of the coolest things about it is that all of the config is in YAML files, so it's just um, plain text, and you it is a series of instructions for how to build out the the cluster. 
And the, the series of instructions can be something that you type in manually. So there's a format that you follow and then you put in what you want. But uh, I think more commonly, there are uh, the tools that, that can be deployed on Kubernetes already have the config available for you to just copy and paste. And I don't know if you want to talk about Helm now, Usman? Yeah, exactly. So there are some tools uh, which uh, which can help you. So uh, uh, you can you have two options. You can write your code manually, which which then you know what you have done and you are the sole owner and can make modification. But it is very complex as well. Or you can use tools like what Nicole said, Helm. So Helm is a open source and free tool which you can use to deploy a application. And the concept is known is known as deploying a Helm chart. In this Helm chart, you have all the YAML code with some uh, TypeScript code as well as, uh, if I remember correctly, Helm do use TypeScript code as templating. And uh, you can also modify that. But with that, uh, as a whole, uh, because Helm is used, uh, becoming a kind of a standard in the industry, especially for the Kubernetes. And uh, all you need to is add like a repository and say like Helm install my application. And if your application have a Helm chart, it will get installed. And you can easily uninstall it as well by using Helm install. So it is very easy, very convenient, and most important, it's open source. So you don't pay for it, you use it for free, which is really cool, I love it. Yeah, me too. I think it's just the easier way to do it because, yeah, you can do it yeah. manually, but you always miss like spacing or indentation or, you know, there's always there's so much that you might miss. Yeah, exactly. And uh, today, uh, also today, we are taking, take, uh, going to take a look in the manual part, but uh, I have already uh, creating some work on the documentation for the Helm Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes Grafana part. So next session, whenever we have, that will be all more cooler and automated as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess before we move on to installing Grafana on Kubernetes, just a note on installing Kubernetes itself is that there are kind of two main flavors you can install vanilla Kubernetes, which is just actually installing Kubernetes, but you can also install a distribution. So a distribution is kind of a wrapper around Kubernetes for different reasons. Sometimes um, it simplifies Kubernetes and sometimes, you know, there are some niceties around the CLI that just make it easier to work with. Yeah. So I think that, I think, Really, for most people, especially if you're learning about Kubernetes and you're not actually deploying or want to deploy a production ready application or environment, then I think the, the best way to go would be one of the distributions. What do you think, Usman? I totally agree, Nicole, because uh, I even me, when I was hearing all in the market about Kubernetes, I only heard like you have to buy or use GCP or AWS such services, which which is totally fine. But uh, uh, if you are new and you are want to learn, so there are definitely some other Kubernetes uh, distributions available, which are also free. And I will also recommend to use them because uh, it is easier and you don't, if you want to learn something new, you want to start from the basic, you don't want to go something very complex, you know? And uh, for example, uh, the one which I use and I'm still using is called Minikube. Minikube is basically you can install it on your machine or even on a virtual machine. And it's very lightweight yeah, because normally if you want to install Kubernetes as on, as a scratch, then you need a powerful machine, maybe three virtual machines, uh, uh, like two worker nodes and a, one main server node. So uh, it is also, uh, yeah, uh, resource uh, takes a lot of resources, but there is Minikube, which is free. There's also um, also micro K8S as well. Uh, by the way, Docker desktop also provides support uh, uh, the, or the integration of Kubernetes as well, which is again free. So um, try these out. Uh, uh, these are totally uh, available uh, for everyone. And I think it's a good place to start before going uh, uh, into complexities like using Kubernetes directly on, on any uh, public cloud services. 
Yeah, I've also used K3S and K3D, yeah. which is uh, which basically runs K3S on Docker containers. And um, K9S is fun because it's like K9s. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a cool CLI. Um, there's also Kind, which runs oh, yeah. the Kubernetes clusters on Docker containers too. Yeah, I, but, I, I um, yeah. I totally but yeah, there, there's so much, right? Like there's there's so many different distributions. I think Minikube is a good place to start. And it's also, I think, um, what we have in our documentation or it's one of the the options anyway, because it's a very popular one. Um, what we, Usman mentioned earlier about um, G, GKE. So there's also managed Kubernetes on cloud services. So Google, AWS, Azure. So they all have their own service or, or an engine. Um, they all call it slightly different things, but there's like DigitalOcean has one as well. Yeah. And I wouldn't suggest jumping to that first. I think just run it locally, like on, on some um, server that you can control directly just so you know you don't have the added um, complication definitely i totally agree because uh, 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 it is a complex software what we have seen in the slide like there is a learning curve in kubernetes so before yeah. you jump to the complex start something with basics so and this is today we we, we gonna take a look awesome okay. well why don't you go ahead and show it to us yeah, sure. So uh, um, this is our documentation uh, page for deploying Grafana on Kubernetes. And uh, 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 before you begin, so uh, there are some uh, things which you can read about, like uh, uh, where to find Kubernetes, the version information. Also, there are some links like Minikube, Nicole said about Kind. Yeah, Kind is also very popular. And also, uh, uh, if you want to run on cloud services, there are the links uh, you can check and see which one fits your use case. Yeah. Uh, then comes to the part of system requirements. So uh, these are uh, these this gives you an idea like what are the minimum system requirements. Maybe you need more, but at least have one GB of disk space, at least 750 MB of RAM, and uh, at least 2.5 cores of CPU required. For example. Um, uh, this this goes well if you are running Kubernetes locally and playing for testing or like for fun. So it's totally fine. Um, there are some other uh, support it database and web browser requirement which you can see. Uh, yeah, uh, we uh, I think we will jump now to the part where we have to deploy Kubernetes. One only information is that to make sure that a port 3000 is enabled in your network requirement because it's the Grafana default port, which we're gonna see. So step one is to create a namespace. So what is a namespace? So namespace is basically a name, as the name says, like you create a private space uh, uh, or you can create a private space in Kubernetes. So that will be used for your application deployment and no other application will share that namespace. Uh, this gives you a bit isolation. And I think it is uh, better to create this because if you create, uh, uh, if you don't use a namespace, the Kubernetes cluster will deploy your services in the default namespace. And maybe there are some other applications which are already using port 3000 or similar ports and you run into complication. But using this uh, will ensure that you have a, 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 a good clean start, I would say. So let's try this out. So I have Kubernetes installed and running on my uh, cluster, which is I'm using a Minikube. So I will first create this namespace. Namespace got created. And to verify, you can use uh, this command. NS is for the short term of namespace. And I can see uh, my Grafana namespace got created. Uh, yeah. I then also it, want to quickly say that um, namespaces are particularly good too if you're if you have multiple deployments of the same application in different environments. You don't want to accidentally push something to production when you meant to do it in the testing environment. So you would use namespaces for that. And one cool thing that I really like um, for switching quickly between namespaces is kubeNS. If you, it's also an open source tool. 
Yeah, that's true. Uh, it is very useful uh, to s switch between NS because uh, if I need to use uh, uh, get some information, then I have to write the complete comma. But with cube NS, like then it becomes your default namespace, and then you just type kubectl get services or whatever you need. So it's a, it's a good tip. <laughs> and yeah, so next step is to create this YAML file, uh, which I have already did. And this is the code which we're going to use. The name of this file is uh, grafana.yml. Uh, I have this uh, placed here. So it's uh, grafana.yml. Uh, I haven't modified anything. It is exactly what it is. And I would like to just give you an overview of what we have in this, uh, in this YAML file. So basically, we have three things here. So we are defining three objects. The, it's uh, the PVC. It's called the persistent volume claim. What it does, it stores the data. So, okay. Then uh, we have a service part, uh, uh, which is starting from here. This is the service part. And by the way, it was the PVC part or the persistent volume. The services part is used to provide network services to the pod so that uh, you can access your pod on the network and do things. And the last part is the deployment object, or I would say object, it's the right term. Uh, the, uh, the, this object is actually responsible to deploy pods uh, and create the services and manage the uh, replica sets, updates, and so on. So this is the deployment uh, object part. And uh, this is where we have to define one thing, which is called the image, container image. This is the... Uh, 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 template and uh, this is we are defining the Grafana image. Basically, this image is taken from again from Docker image from hub.docker.com and uh, we named this uh, container as Grafana and with some other uh, settings uh, which are mostly default, but uh, we, we will see more. Uh, the other important thing is we are defining the port which we want to use. As we said, that 3000 is normally the default, so we will also keep 3000 uh, a port here to get access for TCP and also for other uh, other services as well. So 3000 will remain same here. Um, now let's try to deploy this. So the, for the deployment, this is the command. So you, what you will do is that kubectl apply minus f and then name of the file so grafana.yml and then you have to tell the namespace uh, 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 in my case it's my grafana so my grafana and you can see that uh, we have created three objects as we discussed first pvc deployment and services and to make sure that everything is running fine so what you can do uh, uh, Use the kubectl get all command and uh, in the namespace microfana. And you can see that, okay, everything gets deployed and it will take a little bit time to get uh, services ready. So currently, uh, a replica set is uh, getting ready. I think every service uh, needs some time before it gets ready. So we can clear this out and check again. And yeah, voila. Um, Things are now up and running. <laughs> so this is cool uh, way to check everything. Uh, you can also use different commands as well. Like if you want to check only interested to check uh, uh, the ports, uh, to, you can use kubectl get post and use the, again the namespace my Grafana, and you will only get the pod information. One more cool thing I just want to show you is that you can use the minus O option, which is minus O wide. And it, it gives you more wider range of the command output, like with more details. Uh, this is uh, useful if you are using Kubernetes with some other uh, application and you define some selector or some specific tags, but that's for the advanced part. For now, we are focused on the uh, main part, like how to make it up and running and can use it as well. This is exactly what uh, I have described here. Uh, yeah, one thing I also like to show is that uh, if I run this command, uh, what it will tell. So without O, for example, I get this information. This is also useful because uh, it, it gives you the information of your PVC object that uh, what is the status, what is the volume name. It has capacity of one GB. And 
access mode. So access mode is a uh, read write once. It's not read write only, it's read write once. And if I use minus O write option, then I get more options, for example, volume mode and uh, yeah, actually one more column here. But again, minus O uh, write option is really useful if you want to check in more detail. Now, uh, there are multiple ways to access Grafana on Kubernetes. So uh, one way is that if you are using a managed cloud service or uh, for example, what we have discussed uh, or Nicole said that they are like GKE, AWS, Azure, every like whatever fits in your case, then for example, at least in GKE, uh, you don't need to uh, uh, do anything after, the, after you deploy your application, you will have a external IP which is uh, managed by the cloud provider as a load balancer and you will need that IP and you can access your service. But if you are using like uh, any other service, for example, um, uh, uh, Minikube or kind, then you need to do some additional steps, which we gonna take a look. Uh, in case of Minikube, uh, you have to expose the service. Uh, uh, so, this is the detail, like you have to expose the service, uh, uh, change the type from load balancer in the YAML configuration and uh, use this command minikube service and then expose it. Uh, maybe I think there is a little bit mistake, I'm not sure, but let's let's give a try by running this command because this is the main command which will expose the service uh, to be available uh, and access outside from our virtual machine. So let's try this out. So, yeah, perfect. So as you can see here that uh, it is telling it uh, the name is space is my Grafana. The name of my uh, deployment or the container was also Grafana. Port is 3000 and this is the URL which I can use to access the service, right? And uh, to verify this, what we can do is that we can use the curl command. So curl and I just copy paste it all. Okay, so it says that it found the endpoint via API. And uh, this means that it is uh, publicly available. And this is exactly what here given in the instructions or the documentation as well that now we have to use this IP to access this port. So let's try this and check it on our browser. And there you go. You can access your Grafana server using Minikube as well on your browser. And this is actually, you know, a tricky part because even when I was learning uh, uh, the, the uh, even before Grafana about Minikube, like there are certain ways in every flavors of uh, uh, Kubernetes, like it might be different in kind, it, but in Minikube it is. I found it a bit easier and now I can uh, found a way like how to use uh, Grafana from my browser instead of doing anything fancy. And if I type like admin, admin, which is the default uh, username and password, I can log into the uh, UI. And this is exactly what is defined here. Uh, I have also uh, like to ex I will also like to explain one another option, which is option two here listed, which is using the port forwarding method. So in case uh, again, it depends on your Minikube version or, or or your environment. If this option one does not work, then for sure you can use the option two, which can def which will definitely work. Like 99% cases, it should it will. So. In, in Minikube, what you do is that first type the Minikube IP, IP and it will give you a IP like 192.168 something. Then um, uh, you find the information of uh, the Grafana ports which are running in your namespace. So you use the, we can try that out, it's not a problem. So uh, we get this uh, pod information uh, using the kubectl get command. And now we see that uh, this is our pod name. and then what we do is that define this kubectl port forward command. So basically we are telling uh, uh, Minikube that uh, we are kubectl that port forward uh, this port which has this name in this namespace to the address uh, uh, with port 3000, 3000. Here zero, zero means like it will, 
it will go out public. Uh, we are not restricting to, to it IP. And once uh, we uh, go to our minikube IP command, which we got here, and just write 3000, we can access this uh, uh, in our web browser, I mean the Grafana UI in our web browser. So you see like there are multiple options to access. The, I, I, I'm, I know also there are actually more, but uh, to avoid the complexity, even in the, this documentation, I only described the, the most two famous one. So yeah. Okay, so uh, now uh, comes to the main part, which is really interesting for any use case, is to uh, how to update an existing deployment using the rolling update strategy. So this is a, a very detailed topic, but uh, I will try to explain you like this, that for example, if you uh, are running a Kubernetes uh, deployment, for example, in, in this case, Grafana, and you want to update Grafana to a newer version. Uh, so there are some built-in option in Kubernetes which can allow you to uh, use some uh, uh, update strategies. So rolling update is the default strategy, which means that if you update to a higher version and you want to uh, keep a history, you can do that so that you can uh, uh, roll back as well. And uh, uh, in the past, uh, the command we use is the uh, uh, um, kubectl rollout command with the flag of record. However, in recent, uh, uh, the record flag option is, uh, uh, is uh, may no longer be supported uh, in future. So you can use the alternate or the new option is called kubectl annotate. Uh, how to use it? We will take a look, which will be more practical. So let's try this out. So the first step is to view the history, like where your current deployment history stand. What is your current history? And to do that, simply copy paste this command uh, and see the history part. So currently we see that uh, we have single revision with no change cause because we just deployed our Grafana uh, container on, on the Kubernetes, okay? So this is exactly the same. We have done nothing, but we can name this, we can annotate this. And to do that, uh, to do that we use this command kubectl annotate, then defining the deployment object. The deployment object is Grafana, and then using this command option or, or the parameter, I would say not command, the parameter kubernetes.io and defining the change cost. So the change cost can be anything like a metadata, like deployed the base YAML file or the initial deployment. And then if you, like in our case, we have a namespace, we define the namespace uh, with it. So let's try this out. Okay, uh, deployment uh, got annotated. So now let's run the previous command and see the history. Now you see it is changed from none to what we have defined. So it is basically like uh, we add a uh, metadata, uh, more information to our deployment history, uh, which we can use for uh, rolling updates and rollbacks. Now let's do some advanced one. <laughs> I would say. Uh, oh, before we, we get there, could you actually show us how to log in to Grafana? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think maybe I missed it. So uh, let me log out. Uh, so uh, this is the part. Because I think a common question is, you know, how do you, what, what pass, how do you get the password? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, this is the cool thing I want to say, like if you are deploying Grafana uh, using, uh, uh, without any automation service or external service, like not external, but like service like Helm, then whatever you have defined in your code uh, will be used. So in our code, uh, we have not defined any secrets for password. We are using the default one. So we use this, um, uh, URL, which we got from the exposing the Minikube service. And this is the URL which we'll get. And we use the default admin for username and admin for password. And we just skip this part. And this is how you can log in and um, check, uh, for example, um, the version is 10.0.1. And yeah, go to administration. You can also, if you like, um, 
I believe that, yeah, you can check more information about uh, license and status, but this is an open source one, so you don't need to. But you can define, for example, change your uh, password here. Currently, you're using the admin one. You can change in the administration users and define a new password. So this is, yeah, uh, very useful. Uh, if you are deploying Grafana and you want to change the default password, simply you can do it from here as well. I hope Great. that's, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I also wanted to mention that um, because what Usman is showing is like the just a copy from our documentation, but if you do want to use Helm instead, you can also use this. Um, we do have some Helm charts on the Grafana GitHub uh, account, so check that out as well. And yeah. it's only slightly different there if you are using Helm. I, b I believe the Grafana one, the manifest for Grafana, it actually defines a secret. So you'll have to get that secret separately. But there'll be instructions in the GitHub repo too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's uh, Nicole said, said it right that uh, we have the Helm chart and uh, it provides the instructions. So uh, I recently tried it out. So if you install Grafana via Helm chart, so uh, once the uh, it gets deployed, it will show you like an instruction how to get the uh, password, the secret password, how to decode it because it's normally encoded. And there there is complete instruction. So that is part of the Helm package. Yeah. Okay, so let's... Shall we continue? Yeah. Yes, go for it. Cool. Um, yeah. So where were we? Um, yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, we have changed the uh, metadata, and now we have seen the uh, history has changed uh, using the kubectl rollout command. Now we want to make some modification in our Grafana image version. So, for example, um, this is what we're gonna do. Uh, we will use the edit deployment. What it does, so this is uh, what it will do that it will edit your current deployment, which you have already deployed uh, on the Kubernetes cluster. So it's not something like you make some changes in the Grafana YAML file and expect that and have to upload, but it's like a change on, on, like a, on the fly. So let's try this out. So kubectl edit deployment and then Grafana is the name and yeah so now you can see that this is not all the part of the code <laughs> so if if I go very quickly back here you can see that I have like like this is all the code and I cannot see anything like this which 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 uh, which do appear here so we can say yeah it's so it makes sense that like, yeah or it 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 gives you the the proof that it is like uh, the code is deployed and we are editing the uh, the yaml code which is currently running for our deployment but since we want to uh, make some changes in our uh, deployment version so for example right now um yeah, uh, we are using, uh, in our case, we are using the latest one. So this is the image name, uh, image. Uh, we are using Grafana, Grafana latest. But let's suppose that uh, we want to use a dev image. So Grafana uh, uh, do provide uh, uh, dev images as well. Uh, we normally use a stable. But let's try to use this uh, dev image because we are interested or maybe there is a new feature which we are waiting, but we have to wait longer. So why not try it on our own? So I, I will edit this. And uh, so now you see that uh, deployment uh, is edited. OK, this message you should also see. And then uh, to verify that uh, uh, it is successful, we use the rollout status command. So uh, we have used the rollout history command to see our rollout history, but we can now see the status of the new deployment uh, changes we made. And let's try this out. So you see that it is waiting for the deployment to get finished. So it is changing 
this is the part where you see the orchestration like it is rolling out the changes managing the replica sets uh, 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 removing the old uh, pods and services and deploying the new ones so this is all what kubernetes provide you which we do not see in the background because yeah and now you see that uh, the deployment went successful and we have deployed a new image so let's try to run the old command so kubectl get all minus n my grafana and you should see that everything is uh, pretty new so uh, ignore this one this is uh, this is the old one which is not will be not working anymore but everything is like uh, 54 64 seconds uh, we have a new uh, pod running uh, the services is okay this is uh, older so there is no need change in the service except that we change the deployment so makes sense uh, or maybe I'm looking it incorrectly or um, yeah okay so this is new so yeah okay so yeah there are some changes it made automatically as it required this is what i can yeah i would say that not everything changed only things which are required to change get changed while the rest remain same so this is again a good demo i also didn't know that much so it was a good practice call which we just did <laughs> okay so uh, Yeah, we did this this part. So uh, and uh, let's try to run this. So this will check the, all the uh, status of the deployed object, uh, which we I think we, we we just did. So this is also fine. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna verify that if our deployment is uh, really changed on on the on the UI side. So now we are using this image. Remember that. So let's try to uh, log out, sign out, and now you see at the bottom let me make it a bit bigger you see we are using the pre-image the dev image right we are not using the the one uh, which we have used the initial one the latest one so we are using the dev image so this verifies that our deployment really went successful so this is another way to check out uh, from the from the uh, ui side that uh, if it is there or not so if i log in back and let's also see the version yeah so it's the pre-image so this is cool cool stuff <laughs> nice okay so we we are running up on time a bit and i i thought maybe we could do our usual wrap up if you're okay with that yeah let's do that so uh uh I will just go very quickly. So um, uh, you can also, so uh, you can also once you deploy something and you want to roll back. So there is a complete instruction how to uh, roll back a deployment. Uh, you can exactly follow these instructions. You will definitely not get any errors. But if you do or missing or found something missing, please uh, uh, report it uh, uh, in our uh, uh, GitHub repository, and we will try to fix it and uh, make it working so yeah uh, uh, what we have learned today or what are the takeovers that uh, well takeaways? i was thinking we could do um the, the, oh, okay. that game again if you oh, don't yeah. mind yeah sure then let me switch back here <laughs> <laughs> do you remember this game <laughs> oh yeah i love this game i don't remember okay. i love this <laughs> <laughs> For the viewers who don't know what I'm talking about yet, we, we're going to play this game where we're pretending to do a five minute podcast. And in that podcast, we're going to be talking about what we what we talked about during this session, except we're condensing it to five minutes. Our names will come up and whoever's name comes up is the one that has to start talking. And when the other person's name comes up, they have to pick up from where the first person left off. <laughs> this is all impromptu so you know forgive us a little bit <laughs> because we you know there's no actual way to practice this all right are you ready yeah i'm ready <laughs> okay <I guess. laughs> all right so today we've been talking about the importance of kubernetes first we talked about the evolution of distributed computing and how we went from hardware physical servers to virtual servers to Docker containers or just containers in general, and then to co container orchestration engines like Kubernetes. 
And uh, we also learn like different flavors of Kubernetes, like how you can use uh, uh, the, both the uh, publicly available one, but if you are using uh, uh, on local uh, or testing, you can use the one which you can deploy on your local machine. And we learned something really good about like, <laughs> about <laughs> how to how you can use Docker and Kubernetes in a software development process. So they're not you can use both of them actually, and and that's quite a common use case. You can use uh, you can use uh, 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 basically the Docker Hub images and deploy it in your container in a node. And uh, yeah, that's how you can access. We also learn how to uh, uh, change the uh, deployment versions. Yeah, um, we also talked about how to install, um, how to have namespaces. So, we, and the reason that you would have a namespace is so that you can make sure that you are applying manifest changes to the right environment. And then we talked about different ways to install Grafana by copying the manifest or via Helm chart. Exactly, and we also see like different useful commands, like how to get all all deployment information, or how to uh, use uh, the pod name, and how to get this. And we also with Kubernetes, when you're installing it, you can install vanilla Kubernetes or the managed Kubernetes version. In Usman's demo, he used Minikube, which is a great place to start. And uh, and. If you cannot use Minikube, I would also say like what Nicole said that use Kind. Kind is also very popular, but there are many more. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, use what you feel uh, feel confident, and uh, that's a good place to start. To be honest. <laughs> So Usman wrote this awesome bit of documentation where you can really just follow along the instructions and you can copy the manifest that you need and put it into your local Kubernetes cluster. You can also use Helm using this repository, but we didn't go into that and the instructions will be in the repo. Exactly, and uh, it's up to you. Depends in your use case. Either you can go for Helm if you want uh, automation more easier, but if you want uh, to control your Kubernetes cluster, then use them, this manual approach, which is easy, which is makes sense for your application. So let's say you've got Kubernetes on, let's say with, with Minikube, and you already have the Grafana uh, manifest on there. The next thing that you should do is figure out how you're going to access Grafana once you have the pods up and running. Yeah, and once you have pods up and, uh, up and running, then the second step is to how to access those pods. And this is something we learned today that it is diff it is more easier in the uh, in the cloud environment, but if you are using Minikube, you have to perform some commands. Yeah, so with, when it's on a managed cloud service, you can use the IP address and access it that way. But if it's local, either you can expose the service or use port forwarding. Yeah. And there are actually multiple ways as well, other than these two. But uh, uh, port forwarding is also very popular, and uh, ser exposing the service is actually much easier. But port forwarding is is a guaranteed way to work. We also talked about the importance of setting up a rollout strategy so that you can always fall back to the previous version. It might seem weird when you're just starting and you just have the one rollout, but you know when you start changing things, it becomes more important. Yeah, and uh, there is always a, a case that you will run into problem. It's it's inevitable, and then for that, always check the Kubernetes log. There is a guide in the documentation for troubleshooting, so use it, and uh, it will help hopefully. One of the things that you might want to change, for example, is the image of Grafana that you're using. By default in the documentation, we're using the latest version of Grafana, but maybe you want to try some of the other features out. And in that case, you can change the image name to the image of whatever it is that you'd like to try. And you can find all this image information actually using uh, visiting the hub.docker.com and check for a Grafana repo. And there you will find uh, all the information about uh, stable and dev uh, images as well. So uh, it's a good place to look whatever you want to use or maybe try some feature which are not available. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it was very fast. <laughs> yeah, it was very quick. I thought, I thought that that was pretty good, actually. Yeah, um, I like it. <laughs> Usman 
for for playing here and and for showing us um, how to install Grafana on Kubernetes. Yeah, thank you, thank you again, Nicole, for for helping me out in, in this uh, office hour session. <laughs> the game was fun, and also uh, for more detailed insight. Again, I will play the game more better. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And next week, we are going to have another guest on. We are going to be talking about something really interesting, a recent release in the Grafana Labs um, projects, actually. It's it's going to be on sp specifically focusing on K6. We're going to be talking about distributed tracing with Grafana Cloud K6. So stay tuned for next week for that. Thank yeah, you, everyone, okay. for watching and have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone.